Welcome to Citizen Science, stories of science we can do together, brought to you by SciStarter. In this episode, gift ideas for science lovers, including weather watcher gear, air quality sensors, children's books, field guides, magnifiers, even t-shirts. It's the Science Shopping Network, SciStarter style. Welcome to everybody to the first annual SciStarter Holiday Gift Guide Live. We are going to be bringing you the best gift ideas for the science lovers in your life. And uh, we'll be sharing some unique, extra special items you are guaranteed not to see on the Home Shopping Network or pretty much anywhere else. And our first guest is Sci Starter's founder, our fearless leader, Darlene Cavalier. Hey, Darlene. Hi, Bob. <laughs> How can I help? So it's the Field Guide to Citizen Science. And uh, it looks like, and I believe it is, the essential gift for any science curious individual on your holiday guest list, that hard to please science fan. Could you tell us about it and you know what level it's at, whether it's for you know people who've done this before, or whether it's for kids, where does this fall and, and who should we be giving it to? Absolutely. There's something for everyone in this. <laughs> so for people who are just starting to just be curious about what the heck is citizen science, um, and basically anybody who is curious or concerned about a topic and looking for ways to be part of a solution to it. So that's pretty much what citizen science is. It's a way for us to take action on things that we're curious or concerned about. So this book was written by me and then two co-authors, Karen Cooper, who is our research colleague, Dr. Karen Cooper from North Carolina State University and Katherine Hoffman as well. So these are members of the SciStarter team and we kind of took gold star projects, we call them, pretty much projects that are going to be around for a while. There are thousands that are on size starter. Some come and go. Other ones are pretty evergreen. Uh, so they're around for a while. And we divided these chapters up into ways that we think people might be approaching their searches just as they search for projects on size starter. We tried to make the book kind of come to life. So there's projects you can do with kids and families together. There's projects you can do in libraries. There are um, projects that require some instruments. We're going to learn some uh, about more of those during today's event. Um, and there's also a calendar at the end. So citizen science mm. throughout the year, things you can do in different seasons. And we'll hear from Henry later about some of the um, projects that are dependent on the weather around you. Um, so anywhere you're located, any age group, any experience level, people who have a, a mobility issues and can't really get out that easily. There's projects for you to do from home too. So like I said, something for everyone. Great. How about teachers? Is this something that, you know, maybe if there's a teacher on your gift list, they could use with like a, a group or a class? There are projects there that are perfect for group activities. And there are projects that were initially designed not to be group activities, but somebody came along and developed additive uh, activities and resources. So um, a little cheat there is to go to scistarter.org forward slash education, and you'll find a lot of those projects that are perfect for formal and informal learning environments. So in other words, in school or out of school learning. Many of them also have um, lesson plans attached to them too. Great. Thanks so much, Darlene. Okay, we alluded to a library program earlier, and now we're going to turn to Darren Ash at Arizona State University, who has a whole collection of gift ideas, which you can purchase on their own as a gift, but they also happen to be available in our library kits, too. So, hi, Darren. Hi. Hi, Bob. How you doing? Good, yeah. So, let's start out with the uh, sky quality meter. Can you describe it for us and tell us what project it's used for? Uh, so, the sky quality meter is uh, from Unihedron. And basically, its job is to uh, measure the night sky. Uh, you know, light pollution is really a, a problem in, a, in the modern age, where we have lots of street lights, um, stadiums with huge lighting systems, and all yeah. that light spills up into the sky at, at night and kind of really mars the night sky so that you see fewer and fewer stars. And so, you know, for many people, they really enjoy the night sky and it's, you know, it's really a shame to have that kind of light pollution uh, really destroying the, the starry skies that we see at night. Um, and 
And, you know, there's other reasons people actually use these uh, light pollution meters. Some, sometimes they're just looking to, um, you know, reduce a city or a town's energy costs, you know, because a lot of that energy, uh, because they don't have the right lighting, spills up into the sky. If they were just to, to switch to, you know, uh, lighting systems that point that light downward towards the streets, uh, it would really cut out that light pollution problem quite a bit. And the last reason is, you know, there's actually, there's more and more evidence that there are actually health impacts. Just that that constant glow coming in from people's windows at night actually kind of disrupts their, you know, circadian rhythms as they're sleeping. And people just don't get quite as good a night's sleep as they used to when they were really dark sky conditions. Um, but the meter itself is really easy to use. It's a kind of a simple on off kind of thing. And it just basically takes a reading of uh, how dark the sky is. So the lower the number, the, the better, actually. And it's part of a Globe at Night project right. from NASA. And they're looking for people's data. What they're doing is kind of de developing a map of um, the, the country and, uh, and even the world as to where there are light pollution problems. And so once you take your reading, you take your kit out of the library, you do your, your reading, and then you can actually submit that data to the Globe at Night project. Okay. Uh, yeah, so that's that's basically right. that meter, um, and it's uh, I think ends up being about one hundred and fifty to one hundred seventy five dollars. Um, that's what I was going to ask. Yeah, because we're as a gift guide because we're talking about buying things. We it's good to know they're in library kits, but not everybody has access to that. So yeah, it's good to share you know around what they cost and how people can buy them. And and I did want to mention also that light pollution is a real problem for animals too. You know, fireflies can't see their mates if it's really right out right. and insects, um, nocturnal hunters, all sorts of things get really messed up um, by all this incredible light pollution that we have. Yeah, that that's creates. a great point. Yeah, it's a great point. Yeah, it really affects uh, yeah, animals, especially nocturnal animals. So this is a way for people to actually take part in trying to solve this problem and NASA's behind it. And uh, but they need your input. And the way you give them the input, if you don't have access to it um, through a library or something is to actually have one, you can share it with your neighbors and you can get your neighborhood onto this globe at night map and resource and help scientists um, deal with this. Yeah, a lot of people have uh, have been engaged in this particular project and really one of the more popular citizen science kits that we have. Great. And now the, the air beam, uh, this is a device that's sort of similar um, in that it's an environmental monitoring device. It's uh, it's not crazy pricey. Um, it's a little expensive, but people can own it, and it's for air quality, right? And but, yeah, it's uh, what it does is it measures air pollution, you know, particulates. So I think two point five and ten microns. That's that's what a lot of the home ones uh, measure the two point five and ten. Uh, but this the the cool thing about this one is it's not just sitting in your home. Uh, you can actually take it around with you. It's uh, it's palm size. It's got a battery on board. Uh, I think it's something like 15, 17 hours of battery uh, once you charge it. Um, you know, again, you uh, use your phone to connect to it through Bluetooth. And um, they've added, you can now do it for both Android and, and iOS, uh, Apple. Huh. And, and Emma will correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I think we have discounts available for these, don't we? We certainly have ordering information that we can put up either in the chat or, or somewhere, right? Absolutely. We have ordering information of where to buy these um, these monitors, but the only discount currently available is through the Sky Quality Meter. Okay. Um, and we did add that to the chat and I'll add that to the follow-up email as well for anyone. Um, but it is a significant discount from the, um, from the total price. Oh, that's super. Thanks, Emma. Now, uh, Darren, before we uh, move on from the AirBeam, could you let us know where we go uh, to submit our data? It's the Aircasting website. Uh, and you submit your data and they're creating a habitat map. So it's uh, pretty cool. You go there and uh, you can see um, everyone else's data that's there. You can you know take a look in your local area as to what other people uh, are recording uh, in the way of out, you know outside uh, particulates. And you know you really do see you know if there are local wildfires or you know something going on in your area, you can see that uh, you know those particulates spike up in your in your area. so, uh, you know, really good for yeah. people to know, uh, especially you know with respiratory issues. And these two are both of these are classic citizen science because, like, scientists can't 
go into everyone's backyard. They can't get a map that shows in fine detail how all these, whether it's light pollution or, or particulate matter. Mm -hmm. um, and they can see some stuff from space, but not in fine detail. But if we have enough people that take these and take readings and put them up, scientists can monitor this and it really helps them um, try to alleviate the problems. Yeah, All right. And I think they call it kind of hyper-local uh, measurements is what, uh, mm -hmm. is what they refer to it as. And so, yeah, everyone becomes um, part of the network, uh, part of that system to pool all that data together. So definitely takes a village. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then do you have the CO2 meter too? Uh, I do. Uh, uh, and that's this uh, instrument here. It's it's uh, an Aronet 4. You know, it gives you the number of uh, in parts per million of the CO2 in in your environment. You know, and you will, if you're in a small room, you have, there are several people there, you'll, you'll see the, your CO2 levels start going up. You know, not only is CO2, um, you know, very high levels of CO2 could be a problem in terms of your health and cognition and, and what have you. But the, the really uh, interesting thing this kind of measures is, uh, you, you know, when there's high CO2 in a room that you're breathing other people's air. Right, the, and the, the higher the CO two, the more you're breathing other people's air, and and which means you're also breathing their germs in. You know, when you're in that kind of environment, you may be breathing in cold viruses, flu viruses, you know, potentially also COVID viruses, and it really gives you an indication of the kind of the ventilation in that room. And maybe if it's if you see high CO twos, you want to open the window or open the door yeah. or get a fan going or even if needed, you know, mask up. This way, you know, hey, there could be a lot of germs in this in this area. Uh, I'm going to put a mask on just in case. Yeah. And I know there's sort of was a group of scientists early in COVID saying this is a great proxy for, for aerosols and people should be doing this. And and finally, they've been getting some attention and there's been some research to show that, you know, when it gets up 800, 900 ppm or whatever, yeah, you either want to open a window, put the ventilation up or or leave the room. Um, and that can really reduce transmission. So again, this is a cool thing where you can contribute to science, but it's also a cool thing where you can, um, you know, have it for your own use. Sure. Yeah. And and again, just um, wouldn't be a citizen science project if we if you couldn't submit your data. And of course, you you can with this as well. There's a group called Raven that has developed a clean air map. Uh, same thing. So you you take your readings and you go and submit them to the clean air map, and you can. You can again see the other people's submissions of data around you at coffee shops or you know whatever it is that you might want to go to. You can you can see that data uh, and see how high the CO two is and how how good the ventilation is in those areas. Uh huh. Great. And I was I was concerned about this at first because it's it's fairly pricey. It's two hundred and fifty dollars. Yeah, two okay. yeah two forty nine. Yeah. Uh, and and then you go on Amazon, you see all these CO2 meters, like 40 or $50 or 60. And we said, oh, that sounds a little out of whack. But um, just by chance, the New York Times wire cutter just did an air quality um, uh, guide. And the only CO2 meter that they recommended was this one. And they and they're really rigorous. And they talk to researchers, scientists, and they say, yeah, the other ones are junk. They the method they use isn't accurate. You can't rely on them. This is the lowest cost one that actually uses professional grade technology, and it was the only one that they uh, that they recommended. So oh, that I felt nice. all right. Yeah, <laughs> spotting on the um, on the article. Yeah, and as I promised earlier, there are discounts. So for libraries in the U.S. purchasing the CO two meter, there is a buy two get one free offer. And for non-library buyers, there's a 15% discount. To get either of these discounts, you'll need to email Mitch Freemark. Uh, that's Aronet's North American Sales Director. He's at mitch.freemark at safftechnica.com. Let me spell that all for you. It's uh, Mitch, M-I-T-C-H, period, Freemark, F-R-E-I-M-A-R-K. And that is at... S A F T E H N I K A dot com. And we'll have a link for that uh, in the podcast info section. Okay, so Darren, anything else you want to share? Uh, I would say the only other thing that, that might be of interest to people, uh, this is something in more like the $30 range, $20 to $30 uh -huh. range. 
our little uh, clip-on lenses. There's a, another citizen science program called iNaturalist, where you're taking images of um, wildlife, flora and fauna, and uploading those images. And sometimes you need special lenses for that. And so there are things that kind of just clip onto a iPhone here or, or other smartphone. There are fisheye lenses, there are macro lenses, um, but some, something like this, you know, kind of comes in these cases. Uh, you can find them for 20, 20, 25, $30. Where, like I say, you can certainly find things like this that are under $10, uh, make great stocking stuffers. Just uh, what I was going to say. <laughs> So. Yeah. And, and, and kids, uh, you know, I mean, grownups can use them obviously, but yeah. um, you put one of these on your phone and give it to your kid and it is so cool. I mean, you may not get your phone back for a while, but other than that, it's a great, uh, great exploration tool. All right. Thanks, Darren. Yeah. Thanks, Bob. All right. Well, uh, so, you know, one part of nature that is of interest to everyone is the weather. And our next guest is going to tell us, you know, what your favorite nature lover needs to be a boss weather watcher. Uh, Henry Regis is at the Colorado State University. He's at Colorado State University, and he's the national coordinator for the Community Collaborative Rain, Hail, and Snow Network, Coco Raz. We're going to have him back here now to talk about Coco Raz and the rain gauge that is perhaps the best one that people who would want to participate might want to use and where they can get it. So over to you, Henry. <laughs> yeah, thank you. A pleasure to be with you guys today. Thanks for inviting us. Uh, Coco Ross, uh, we've been around 25 years now. We uh, are the largest uh, provider of daily precipitation measurements in the U.S., uh, over 25,000 volunteers out there, and we're in uh, six countries, including the U.S., Canada, and others out there in North America. So a great chance for folks to go out every morning uh, measure uh, how much precip fell at their location. They can put the gauge in their yard. Uh, they go on the website, quickly uh, put the information in or use our app. And uh, this information gets put on maps, gets put into uh, tables, but it's it's used very much. I mean, that's just some science that goes in the book. It's used in real time uh, by the weather service, by the city planners, by different other municipalities, climatologists, you name it. Uh, it's it has real impact, and so we really uh, have enjoyed watching this grow across the country and other parts of the world. Uh, and so um, it, we, we invite you to to participate. So this is the official four inch diameter high capacity rain gauge that inner tube uh, holds an inch of rain and it measures all the way to the hundredth of an inch. So a lot of times when you get a couple drops of rain coming down, uh, you can actually measure that. And, and we like those precise measurements. Uh, the whole thing holds over 11, almost 11 and a half inches. So some of the Gulf states and stuff like that, when you get some really, really torrential rains coming through these tropical systems, we're able to measure that as well. This gauge sells for around $35 plus shipping. Uh, it's not your grandfather's rain gauge. So it's not the little one you get from the uh, the, the seed store or, or hardware store. Um, and then we've done 25 year comparison on this gauge to others. Uh, it, it Basically the weather service sees it as the best gauge out there. It comes with a couple parts, the funnel at the top and the inner tube. Uh, we ask folks in the winter to take that out and then measure what falls and actually take uh, snow core samples where we can get the the amount of snow, the, the SWE, which is the snow water uh, equivalent of, of what how much precip fell. So uh, there's a bottle brush for cleaning out your gauge. Some people like to put signs up uh, of the, the, this is their official weather station gauge out there, uh, decals and stuff. And so they they sell a whole bunch of different things which are meant for the, the citizen science observer out there. So the other thing we do, we, we've designed different T-shirts over time. And I know folks always like to get somebody who's involved in citizen science, different things. Uh, we kind of uh, did a precipitation series. So we, we did a precipitation series where we do tropical storms, hail, dust storms, thunderstorms, rain, snow. And I always, you know, when I work with the American Meteorological Society, I said, wouldn't it be great to have shirts with all these weather symbols on them? So we've done those. So they were about 1375 uh, plus shipping. And we also have a Coco Ross polo and twill shirts for folks who belong to that. We have going on right now 
is our Kokoros fundraiser, which we started today, and that'll run through uh, the beginning of the year. Uh, for those who donate uh, 60 and more, uh, a short sleeve flash flood shirt that just came out that's hot off the press. And then we long sleeve for a hundred dollar donation and above. So if you're looking for something like that and you want to give back to a, a good cause, there's a chance to do that. That is great. Thanks. Boy, this is cool. And we have the link for where people need to go to get all of these. And uh, and obviously you need the whole set of the precipitation shirts because you don't want to be wearing your hail shirt when it's raining, oh, yeah. rain you shirt bet. when it's snowing. So you gotta you have to have them all basically. Yeah, we, we've got a closet full of them uh, here in our <laughs> office too. Everybody seems that people collect them. They they like to collect the sets. So that's a, a neat thing, and it's fun designing them each year too. That is great. Thanks so much, Henry. Thank you. All right, and now ideas for the science curious kid. Of course. I mean, it is the gift giving season and and we should be focusing on kids. Right. So we have with us award winning children's book author, Susan Edwards Richmond, author of the books Bird Count and BioBlitz, among others. All right. Hi, Susan. Hi. Um, so um, I am a children's author and I'm actually also a teacher as well. I teach at a nature preschool at a Mass Audubon sanctuary in Massachusetts. Okay, and uh, what inspired you to write these books? So one of the inspirations for me is the idea of getting kids out in nature. And both of these books, Bird Count and BioBlitz, are based on real events that really do take place all over the world in some form or another. Um, the Christmas Bird Count is quite well known, and many of you probably are either are participants or know quite a bit about it. I participated in it for more than 20 years now. And um, I thought this would just be a wonderful thing to get kids excited about, um, not just in the wintertime, but at any time of the year. And so one of the purposes of my book is to design it so that as close as possible mirrors the experience of actually going on these a bird count or a biodiversity count. Um, and my, my illustrator, Stephanie Pfizer Coleman, who's actually from West Virginia, I'm from Massachusetts, um, did a great job of illustrating all of these birds and, and creatures. Okay, it mirrors the experience of uh, actually doing the event. How, how do you do that? Uh, I mean, this is bird count. Um, the child is kind of the no mo motivating uh, spirit in the book, gets her mom up and they're part of a team. And then she does the tally and you can see, I don't know if you can see this, but I have um, the illustrator has done a tally sheet on the side of each spread so that you can count the birds along with the character. Um, so if she sees five geese, you can actually count all the geese on the page and then the tally mark is in the book. So by the end of the bird count, they've accumulated quite a nice list of birds that shows everything that's been found. And um, we learned that you can see identified by sight as well as by sound. And um, on my website, we all, I, I do have some lesson plans. So if you want to check that out, um, if you're a teacher or a librarian or have some kind of a nature program, and you can also either get one of these sheets, which has tallies of Northeastern birds, or if you're in another part of the country, you can swap in copyright free images and um, custom design your own tally sheet. And the kids just have a great time. My three to five year olds love to get them out there with a, a dry erase marker and these tally sheets and they're, they're good to go having a great time. So the other book, um, BioBlitz is about a biodiversity count. So it's a little bit different, it's not a census, it's about all the different creatures. Um, and both books are kind of organized by habitat. So the child on a team goes into each habitat, a pond habitat, a butterfly garden in this case, or rolling a log and looking for critters under the log. And again, trying to mirror the experience of what it would be like to go from habitat to habitat and what creatures you might see along the way. And again, we have a tally um, on the side which has not numbers of animals, but um, each, each identified species. And in this mm -hmm. case, there's sort of a competition between the character from Bird Count, Ava appears as the main characters in this book, Gabriel's cousin. So she's, Ava's on one team, Gabriel's on the other. 
Gabriel loves bugs. Ava loves birds. So they kind of compete to see which team. Oh, read, read us a paragraph. Read us just a little bit. Well, I'm sure. Let's see. Look, I shout as an orange patterned butterfly wings past a great spangled fritillary. Ranger Kai gives me a wink. You're with me, Gabriel. Ava, who's on dad's team, is already pointing out a bird. Bet our team finds more, I call to her. You're on. So that's kind of <laughs> how it <laughs> how it starts out. And um, they go on their separate ways, but they meet up a couple times. And the culmination, they meet at the gazebo. There's a white sheet with the lights shining on it. And they're identifying the night insects at the <sighs> end. So there's a lot of um, science learning as well as math opportunities if you're a teacher, there's just like so many different activities that you can spin off this. And there is a teacher's guide on my website for bird count. There's one coming for BioBlitz. It's not quite up yet. Um, they're on the Peach, Peach, they're both published by Peachtree Publishing Company um, out of Atlanta. And um, you can get them through the publisher. It's distributed by Random House, or I always just say, ask your local independent bookstore. I just, I love to patronize mine, mm -hmm. <laughs> my bookstore. So I'm always asking people. It's it's usually on any distributor's list. So it's easy to obtain. Oh, that's awesome. I love that. I love bio blitzes. I've been on them. I've yeah. led them. I've, it's the best. It's, it's <laughs> exciting. I mean, it's really exciting too, because Bird birds are cool because I mean that's my love because they're everywhere all seasons you can be in an urban environment you can be in a rural environment you're always going to see birds at any time of year but what I love about the biodiversity count and bio blitz and what I do is as a nature preschool teacher is get kids excited about every form of life like it's exciting to see an ant it's exciting to see a worm and um these books are geared to sort of pay, um, four to eight year olds and their families so you catch kids that at that age and everything's cool. You know, if it, if it's it moving, <laughs> it's exciting. That is so great. And everyone can't be in your class, but everyone can get these books so they can. Exactly. Virtually. And what I heard was that um, and the pandemic was not a good thing for anyone mm. really, but it did get people out in nature. And um, these books were helpful to get families out and about uh -huh. enjoying them. That is so great. Well, thanks so much. Yeah, thank uh, you for having me. Yeah, yeah. I fun. did. I had a couple of things I just can't help sharing. I'm surrounded by them. This is my little science corner. And you just mentioned, um, well, first off, you just mentioned bugs. So field yeah. guides, mm. these things are the best. These could be stocking stuffers too. There's so many of them and they get kids excited. They get grownups excited. And, um, and they're not very expensive. We've talked about but uh, critters, but you know they won't have ones for rocks and minerals and and things like that as well. And one of my favorites, uh, this is from Cornell, and it's a book, right? But it actually has the bird calls in it. This is a song sparrow, and you just hit the thing. You hear that? You have to be careful with this because I. I just did this the other day with a uh, tufted titmouse and uh, I was out on the deck and a male titmouse came skittering in like a, like a jet fighter on an aircraft carrier thing. Bam, bam, bam. Where is it? Where is it? Where's the intruder? And I felt so bad because it was freaked out that uh, this other bird was in its territory. So uh, that's an irresponsible use of this book. <laughs> I, and I did it by mistake, but don't do that. Um, magnifiers, loops, which you might not think, think of, but they're great for kids. And you put these in and it's just like those micro things that you put on your camera, but you can see super, super close minerals and, you know, amethyst, agate, um, rose quartz, and you can use the magnifiers to look at them. And um, fossils, I get this from the, somebody called the fossil guy. Um, there's like a 500 million year old uh, trilobite that if you look through the loop, looks awesome. Ammonite. This is the sort of things that, you know, really get kids excited. Uh, and I have finger puppets. There we go. Hello, I am Marie Curie. And uh, it has information about her. And uh, I have a whole set. I have, I have Einstein back here. I got Newton. And lastly, very important, a box for 
kids to keep all their stuff in. So this was mine when I was seven. And you can tell it was very keep out, keep out top <laughs> secret because I had a teenage sister who tormented me. But if you put keep out twice in top secret, not just secret, no way no one's ever going to open that. So I knew it would be all my secret collecting stuff, seeds and fossils and arrowheads would be safe in this. And again, just the sort of thing that gets kids permission to get out and explore. Okay, well, that's all we have for you this time. Check out the links we're including in the info section of this podcast to learn more about the science gift ideas we described. And let us know what you think of them at info at scistarter.org. I'm Bob Hershon. Thanks for listening. This podcast is brought to you each month by SciStarter, where you will find thousands of citizen science projects, events, and tools. It's all at SciStarter.org. That's S-C-I-S-T-A-R-T-E-R dot O-R-G. SciStarter's founder is Darlene Cavalier. And thanks so much to you, the listener and citizen scientist, for getting involved and making a difference. If you have any ideas you want to share with us and any things you want to hear on this podcast, get in touch with us at info at SciStarter.org. Once again, our email address is info at SciStarter.org. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time.